Hello everyone and a pleasant good afternoon, evening, wherever you may be listening to this. Another Wrestling Logic Extra. This is another weekly wrestling roundup. We're going to get right into it. We're going to review last week's Dynamite, last week's SmackDown, this week's Raw, and this week's AEW Dynamite all within this one time frame. I am not reviewing uh, Friday Night SmackDown. This week I will review, well pardon me, I will not review the show in entirely. I will mention a couple things that happened on SmackDown on the Final Battle review. Which I will do, which is before winter is coming anyway, which is going to be our season finale for Wrestling and Logic, which means there will be no more shows pretty much until the new year. Probably until the Royal Rumble, potentially. But other, or maybe, uh, it depends on what Cabo thinks, but other than that, winter is coming at pretty much the end of season two. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get right into it. Last week's AEW Dynamite from November 30th, 2022. We were live at the Indiana Farmers Coliseum in Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana, please, please get better at y'all crowds. Okay, please. Uh, okay, listen. I know normally I would hate on crowds, especially for, you know, a show like this. But Indiana, y'all were interesting tonight. Y'all were a good, y'all were a good bunch of guys. So, yeah. Uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, round of applause. Good for y'all. All right, Excalibur, Tony Schiavone, and Taz on commentary. John Moxley in the ring. John Moxley says, You know I grew up about 90 miles from here, as if we did not know that. When I first started, I wrestled here all the time in the Salvation Army gym, and that was a long time ago. This has been a crazy-ass ride. You never know what's around the corner, but there are three constants in this world, death taxes, and John Moxley. There is nobody that can outwork me, out-hustle me, out-wrestle me, out-bleed me, or out-sweat me, I am the top of the food chain, and the AEW ring belongs to me, and you bet your ass that there's not a man in this building in this building that has the balls to come here and look me in the eyes and tell me any different. Hangman Adam Page comes out. Adam Page got Ryan John Moxley face, had a stare down, and Hangman Adam Page is back, everybody. Yes, Hangman Adam Page, who literally had a fucking concussion the last time we saw him, and now he's back. Hangman and Moxley brawled throughout the arena. They beat the fucking piss out of each other, and security ran down to uh, got away from to get Moxley and Page away from each other. So pretty much that was that. Hangman Adam Page and John Moxley. By the way, they are not official for Winter Is Coming. I wish they were official for Winter Is Coming because I would like to see that match right away. Brian Danielson versus Dax Harwood, our first match on the show. Great match. I'm already going to give this a high rating. This was a great match. And I will go through this match in its entirety. Brian Danielson versus Dax Harwood, one half of the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions of FTR. Uh, so it's traditional wrestling, side headlock takeovers, front headlocks, front face locks. Danielson went for a kick, but Dax Harwood ducked it. Dax looked for the sharpshooter, but Danielson grabbed the ropes. Dax then stopped the side of Brian's his head. Harwood and Danielson traded chops. Dax Harwood jumped off the rope with a cross body for a near fall. Dax was flipped over the top rope and Danielson rocketed at him with a suicide dive, knocking Dax over the guardrail into the front row, which was great. Harwood went for a pile driver. Danielson counters. Danielson missed a roundhouse kick and Dax spiked Danielson on his head for a near fall with a pile driver. Dax missed a diving headbutt. Danielson rolled up Dax for a two count. Dan Danielson rocked Harwood with a diving knee strike. Harwood, hold on. Harwood pulled Danielson onto the top turnbuckle, but Danielson slid out and shoved Harwood with Axe crossed himself on the top turnbuckle. Danielson followed up with Hamble and Axe on elbows. And then he superplexed Dax off the top turnbuckle, but Dax switched up, so Dax's Harwood body landed on top, which was a great spot, by the way. Danielson and Harwood traded shots in the center of the ring. Dax Clark, Brian with a lariat, but Brian followed up with a clubbing shot of his own. Danielson went for the roundhouse kick. Harwood cat caught it. Dax attempted a slingshot powerbomb, but Danielson escaped with a hurricane round. Danielson blasted Dax with roundhouse kicks. Dax countered the psycho knee with a slingshot Liger bomb, which was a great spot. After counting another one's cradle pin attempts, pin attempts uh, Danielson put Harwood in the label lock and Dax Harwood tapped out. Yes, one half of the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions lost clean on this show. I got a problem with that. I would have liked it if fucking one of the Acclaim came out and distracted... Um, well... Okay, hold on. I would have appreciated it if the match ended in the DQ because we did not need Dax Harwood losing clean. Dax Harwood cannot lose. Brian Danielson cannot lose. 
I would have liked it if it was a DQ. Instead, Dax Howard lost clean. Why? I don't fucking know. I don't know, and I probably will not understand. Um, next next segment, Tony Schiavone, Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks cuts a promo. He says, I would like to make an announcement. I'm entering myself into the Battle Royal, the Dynamite Diamond Ring Battle Royal, which we will review for Winter is Coming. And I'm going to win it. Oh, I'm sure you are, Ricky. Because I'm coming for everything you have, Max. I'm coming for your spot. Everything that you have, guess what? I am owed that as well. Oh, by the way, Brian Danielson, Dax Howard. I gave wrestling an 8, Logic 7. Good match. Best match on this entire show. And there you go. Rene Paquette was live via satellite with the Jericho Appreciation Society and Claudio Castingoli and Willie Yuta. Claudio says, I need to beat Jericho at Final Battle. And Willie Yuta challenged Daniel Garcia for the Pure Championship. Yes, I will review Final Battle in its entirety as a bonus extra. So, Claudio gets Jericho at Final Battle for the Ring of Honor World Championship, and Willie Yuta gets Garcia for the Pure title. TNT Championship Open Challenge Match. TNT and Ring of Honor World TV Champions, Samoa Joe versus AR Fox, the debuting AR Fox. AR Fox, literally 24 hours before he signed a contract with AEW, and he immediately got a TNT Championship match, which means it is now time for our reoccurring segment. What the fuck did he do to get a title shot? Hit my music. Fuck Jake Hager. It's time for another edition of What the Fuck Did He Do to Get a Title Shot? This is our question of this entire segment. What the fuck did AR Fox do to get a title shot? Here are your multiple choice answers. You have 10 seconds to answer them. One, AR Fox signed a contract with AEW. Two, AR Fox asked Tony Khan for a TNT title shot. Number three, AR Fox attacked Samoa Joe on Dark. And number four, Samoa Joe challenged AR Fox on Rampage, leading to this match. I'll give you all about 10 seconds to figure this out. Fuck Jake Hager. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're... if here are the answers once again. What did AR Fox do to get a title shot? He signed a contract with AEW, number one. Number two, he asked Tony Khan for a title shot. Number three, Samoa Joe attacked him on dark. And number four, Samoa Joe challenged him to a match on Rampage. If you guess number one, you are correct. AR Fox lost in eight minutes. There you go. Samoa Joe and AR Fox had a decent match. I did not really care for this because AR Fox did not deserve a fucking title shot at all. And, uh... AR Fox lost in eight minutes. Samoa Joe chucked him out. Actually, he didn't chuck him out. He put the muscle buster on him and won the match. There you go. And then Wardlow came out. And Wardlow says, I hope you enjoy playing the role because I'm coming for what's mine. This is Wardlow's world. And Samoa Joe, by the way, called himself the one true king of television. Well, Samoa Joe, if you are the one true king of television, please stay that way. Thank you. And thank you. Samoa Joe A.R. Fox, I gave wrestling 5, Logic 1, because there was no reason for this fucking match at all. And Wardlow saved this entire segment, whatever the fuck. Alright. William Regal. Oh, boy. This segment. Oh, God. I'm not pissed off, by the way. I am pissed off at what happened at the end. William Regal walked down to the ring. William Regal introduces... Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF. MJF hugs Regal in the ring. Oh boy, this is the part where I will probably say a lot of fucking... Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a good promo by MJF. I'm not really finna go through the rest of this. Instead, I'm going to give a little bit of a uh, cliff note kind of uh, review for this promo. MJF says, I know people. you people aren't very bright. But when the best wrestler on God's Green Earth is on the microphone, you keep your hillbilly's mouth shut. This time, don't grab the dynamite ring. You must grab the brass ring. We met behind closed door, and I can say this man is a genius. He told me to use the brass knucks. He didn't want me to beat John Moxley. He wanted to leave Moxley with an emotional scar so he wouldn't forget the day he was outsmarted by MJF and William Regal. Now let's talk about the firm. I kind of respect the firm. No, you don't. Stop right there. No, you don't. 
No, you don't. MJF, if you respected the firm, the firm would, would have been at full gear and they would have helped you win the match. But then that wouldn't even make any fucking sense. So if you respect the firm, can you please explain to me why you fucking buried him three weeks ago and Ethan Page got fucking destroyed by you, bro? He got kicked in the dick because of you. If you respect the firm, why was the firm on fucking TV? They saw a weakness in me and like sharks smelling in the blood, I would have done the same thing. No, you wouldn't. Speaking of things I'm above, let's talk about this belt. He, so he throws out the original AEW World Championship design. He finally, finally unleashes a new strap for the AEW World Championship. It is the Triple B, the Big Burberry belt. It is a, his um, scarf design pretty much on the strap. It's pretty much wood and leather. It's wooden leather. And it has his scarf at the, uh, at the, on the outside. So now he says, MJF, no one, and I mean no one, deserves to be recognized as world champion set for him. Not any of you pieces of trash, fake tough guys like Eddie Kingston, Ricky Starks, and the worst of the worst fake wrestlers like Brian Danielson. Fake wrestlers? Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. MJF, let me tell you something really fast. Fake wrestlers? Fake tough guys? Okay, I agree with you on the fake tough guys part for Eddie Kingston. Because Eddie Kingston should be nowhere, nowhere near a title shot. Absolutely not. Not that I hate the guy. He just needs... What Eddie Kingston really needs, honestly, is one, to have a lot of emotional investment with, with him, which he already does enough as it is. Number two, Eddie Kingston needs a run, a legit run that people can actually believe and people can share sympathy for him. That's what Eddie Kingston needs. He needs the TNT title. Never mind that shit. He doesn't need the AEW World title. What the fuck? Anyway, um, no offense in comparison to me. Brian Downson couldn't wrestle his way out of a paper bag. MJF, first of all, you couldn't wrestle out of a fucking cab. Get the fuck off my fucking television. He says, I am long, as long as I'm in this company, you'll never know what it's like to be on top. All the way until the bidding war... Of 2024, when I use Triple B as a bargaining chip. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure you'll be champion for two years, MJF. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm really sure. Yeah, okay. If I'm being completely transparent, I don't even know if a wrestling company wins the war. Because I'm getting sick of looking at wrestling fans on a weekly basis. Mainly Hollywood wins, but I'm not deaf. I know there's an interesting amount of you who are over the moon when I became champion. They were. But, don't, but call me Mystic Max because I predict you people are fickle. Because soon enough, you'll say I'm boring. I never wrestle. I always talk. He constantly makes an opponent, jumps through hoops. And to those people, I say, great. But you people will tune in every week. Triple, e, Triple B will be defended very rarely. And I will wrestle very rarely because I am a special attraction. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you are now in the era of MJF. And I almost forgot, but Mr. Regal, without these brass nucks, none of this is possible. For 40 years, you've given blood, sweat, and tears for this business. And that's what I wanted to say from the bottom of my heart. And then he blindsides William Regal. Hits him with the brass knuckles to the back of the fucking head. That looked fucking brutal, by the way. Oh, my God. It was nasty. MJF says, you, had, you, ha you said I had much to learn, but you made a deal with the devil. Brian Danielson came down. William Regal stretched it out the ring. And William Regal, I hope, seriously, that you get better. And I sincerely hope for the life of us that you finally realize that you made a fucking mistake. For all of us. There you go. That was the entire promo. Great promo from MJF as always. Ricky Starks versus Ariar Davari. This match went three minutes. No rating. Willow Nightingale versus Jericho Appreciation Society. And a JAS. Get the fuck off my television. Willow knocked down Anna J with a shoulder tackle. She followed up with a short arm lariat. Willow with a crossbody for a near fall. Ty Mello was in the corner. Ty Mello, get off my television. Ty Mello jumping on the apron to a strike. Willow, Anna J grabbed Willow and rolled her off for a near fall. Willow clocked Anna with another lariat and then finished off Anna with a doctor bomb. This match went four minutes. I give wrestling a four and logic one because Willow Nightingale deserved the win. Plus, she has been very impressive on AEW Dynamite. Oh, by the way, Ricky Starks and Ari Davari, no rating. Ricky Starks won with the Rochambeau. Next. 
Backstage, QT Marshall, who is still employed, challenged Orange Cassidy to a Lumberjack match on Rampage, which I did not review. That show was fucking miserable. Next, TBS Championship Celebration. Jay Cargo and the Baddies with Red Velvet, the returning Red Velvet, who returned last week, and Leela Gray. Jay says she was done playing with the Baddies. Either you two get in line but, or you can step because you two are eating off of me. No, we're not. Jay Cargo, if we were eating off of you, we would all starve. Get off my fucking TV. I've said this twice already. And the entire company is eating off of me. I am the brightest star this company has. Nobody has my body, my face, my aura. Nobody wants your face, body, or aura. Get off my fucking TV. I am the real deal. I am nothing but real. No, you're not. I create careers and Lil Bow Wow was a joke. Yes, I did joke that Lil Bow Wow hasn't been relevant since lottery ticket in 2010. I realized it was not 2009. I said it last week. It was not 2009. It's 2010. And he says, a total joke. Bow Wow appeared on the screen. And he was still fixated with Jade. He says that uh, Jade Cargill did not deserve to be at his concert. And that was that. Yes, Jade Cargill and Bow Wow had a fucking angle on AEW Dynamite. That shit was fucking awful. Death Triangle versus The Elite in our main event. I know how Cabo feels about The Elite. So I'm not really going to go through the rest of this uh, main event. This was a good main event as always. Um... Pac went for the Black Arrow, but Matt raised his knees up and managed to roll up Pac for the 1-2-3. So, the Elite won, Death Triangle 2, and 1 to the Elite. Winter is coming, we will review that show, and that will be match 4 of the best of 7. And that was uh, the November 30th edition of AEW Dynamite. I now might as well review this current Dynamite. For December 7th, 2022, we were live tonight in Austin, Texas at the HEB uh, Center at Cedar Park. We were in pretty much outside of Austin, Texas. Anyway, opening match, oh boy. The Dynamite Diamond Ring Battle Royal. One of the most predictable and lamest as fuck battle royals I may have ever seen. First of all, I have so many questions for this battle royal. Number one, Captain Sean Dean was in the final four of the Battle Royal. Captain Sean Dean has not had a match on Dynamite since February. There you go. Why was he on this show? Why was he in the final four? I don't know, but he looked very impressive in this match. I can't lie. Captain Sean Dean needs a push. A little bit of a push, but not, you know, all the way push. He's not, you know, he's not a jobber anymore, essentially, but he's getting better. He's... He had an, uh, an interesting run, but I don't know about Captain Sean Dean in the Final Four of a Battle Royal that no one fucking cared about, by the way. Plus, number one, it was fucking predictable. Ricky Starks was going to win the match. He won the match anyway. He eliminated Ethan Page. So, ta-da. Oh, by the way, Death Triangle versus the Elite. I, I forgot to give a rating for that. So... I gave that match a 7, Logic a 5. There you go. And um, the Dynamite Diamond Ring Battle Royal. Wrestling, there was not a lot of wrestling in this match. I'll give it probably a 3. And then Logic probably a 1. Ricky Starks was going to win any fucking way. But in the end of the day, it did lead to one of the best segments in this entire roundup, in this entire thing. Ricky Starks cut the best promo of his entire career against MJF. I'm not really finna go through the rest of the promo because I'm sure it's on the AEW YouTube page. I'm sure all of you can go watch it. If you can go to the AEW main page on YouTube, you can find the promo there. I'm not really finna go through the rest of the promo because Ricky Starks actually cut a very good promo. And um, he says that he's going to take the belt from MJF and, MJF. and MJF got called a little boy in this segment, which I actually, um, I don't know about that one. I, I mean, yeah, okay, sure. So anyway, MJF kicked him in the dick. Yes, a low blow by MJF. Then Ricky Starks pretty much no-sold the low blow, hit a spear. He speared the shit out of MJF, which was fucking great, by the way. And he held up the AEW world title. And we have Ricky Starks versus MJF for winter is coming. Great. Okay. That was the Dynamite Diamond... 
uh, battle royal thing, which was cool. All right, AEW Dynamite. Uh, let, hold on, everybody. Let me find the next match on this show because there was a lot of shit on this show. First of all, number one, I got a, I got, I got a complaint to make. No, I'm serious. I have a sincere fucking complaint. Tony Schiavone was in five segments tonight. Five fucking segments. Fucking ridiculous. But yes, MJF and Ricky Starks had a good back and forth. John Moxley cut a promo. He says last week didn't get out of hand. And he's really starting to like Adam Page talking with his fists. And this is all elite wrestling, not all elite talking. Tonight, he and Claudio and Willie Uta this, uh, will, you know, win their match. And he also says that at final battle, they will make a statement that um, finally, they will end this feud with the Jericho Appreciation Society. So apparently, Tony Khan, once again, listening to the Wrestling and Logic Extras, because I've been saying for fucking weeks now to end this piece of shit feud with the Jericho Appreciation Society. Please end this feud. Jesus Christ. I hope it does that final battle. Darby Allen versus Samoa Joe for the TNT Championship. This was a great match. Best match on this entire show. Honestly. Because that was like... Actually, no. Second best match on this show. I didn't care about the tag team match. But this was a, a you know, good match for the time that they were given. This was the second best match on this entire show. So, anyway. Darby Allen beating the shit out of him. Joe then turns around. But Darby stays on him. Drop kick, Samoa Joe to the floor, Allen off the ropes, but Joe walks away. Joe plucks him off the apron and swings him into the barricade and the apron and then the barricade again. Darby Allen got his ass whooped for the first five minutes of this match. He got destroyed in this match for the first five minutes. Darby Allen got slammed on the concrete floor, which was fucking brutal, by the way. It was awesome. Allen floats over the powerbomb and then Joe with a snap suit. A snap power slam on the concrete, which was fucking... Oh, my God, that was nasty. And we go to break. Oh, by the way, your referee for this match was Bryce Remsburg. Fucking goon. By the way, I'm serious. I cannot stand... I'm, I'm not going around here. I cannot stand Bryce Remsburg, Rick Knox, and Paul fucking Turner. I cannot stand... You fucking three referees. Bryce Rensburg should have counted out Samoa Joe and Darby Allen. Instead, he didn't. Both men were outside for 15 fucking seconds. Nothing happened. No count up. Ridiculous. That one, it's, it's, it's dumb. Just. I don't get it. And just for that, logic is going to go down for this match. Joe works him over in the corner and throws him into the post. So hard that Allen goes flying out the floor and crashes into the barricade, which was a fucking great spot. Darby beats the count. Samoa with um, roundhouse kicks. Allen paint brushes him with a slap. Joe met him a head and drop. Enziguri, a senton for a two count. To the floor, Dar Darby dives and gets caught, but slips out. And he shoves Samoa Joe knee first into the still steps. Coffin drop. Pardon me. Coffin splash to the floor on Samoa Joe. Back inside. He went for the cocaine clutch, but Allen slips out. He uh, stunned Dog Millionaire by Darby Allen. And he hit the cold red, but it, went, it was a two count. A Uranagi out of the corner by Joe. Joe puts him up on top. Darby then knocks him down. Coffin splash again, counter into the cocaine clutch. Allen did not tap out, but he faded very quickly. And just like that, Samoa Joe won via referee stoppage. Good match. Eight minute match. I gave wrestling seven. Logic a. I gave logic a four. Because first of all, Darby Allen should have been counted out long, long time ago. I would have taken a counter because it would have gotten more heat on Samoa Joe. We did not need them to be outside for the last fifteen to twenty seconds. That was that, that's fucking ridiculous. I don't care if it's a title match. The fact that they were outside that long. And Bryce Rensburg just let them do whatever the fuck they wanted on the outside of the ring? What the fuck happened to AEW having countouts? Where is the fucking countouts? There's no countouts in AEW all of a sudden? They do they do 10 counts, right? 
There should be countouts in some instances. I would have accepted a countout. That's more heat on Samoa Joe. Instead, he choked him out anyway. Fucking ridiculous. Wrestling 7, Logic of 4. Good match. But after the match, which is what I really, really liked. And it was brutal. Darby Allen no sold to Coquina Clutch, first of all. Because he was down literally for like five minutes. And then just got back up as if it was nothing. Samoa Joe heads butt the shit out of him. Joe grabs Darby's skateboard. He almost hit Bryce Remsburg with it. I wish he did. I wish he did hit Bryce Remsburg with it. Get Bryce Remsburg off my fucking TV. I've said this four times tonight. And then Samoa Joe hit the muscle buster into the skateboard, which was a fucking brutal spot. And it was awesome. Samoa Joe is officially solidified as a heel. Thank you. Wardlow comes out. Joe runs off like a scalded dog. And Wardlow and Samoa Joe will face off down the line. If this match is not at Winter is Coming, no one will fucking care about this feud. No one will care. And here's another match I don't care about. Orange Cassidy. Oh, Lord. Here we go. Backstage. Tony Giovanni making his third appearance already. Actually, no, second. Pardon me. He has five segments tonight, by the way. Five. Orange Cassidy interviewed. He offers Kip Sabian an all Atlantic championship match. Pardon me. Stop right here. Can somebody please explain to me what the fuck would Kip Sabian do to get an All Atlantic Championship match? Kip Sabian should be nowhere near championship. When Pac had the belt, I didn't even. Kip Sabian and Pac weren't even. They weren't even fighting on dynamite. Kip Sabian wasn't even having Pac against. Someone else that he was associated with. Why is Kip Sabian being mentioned for an all legend championship opportunity? When we know good and fucking well, Kip Sabian is one of the dark elevation fucking goons. This man lives on AEW dark elevation. That is his home. This man should be nowhere near on Dynamite and nowhere near title shot. Kip Sabian says he got hurt in the Battle Royal. And I hope you get off my fucking television for that matter. Five times I've said this tonight. Orange tells him to go find somebody who can fight him on Rampage. First of all, I don't want to see Orange Cassidy on fucking Rampage. Orange Cassidy is not a draw on AEW Rampage. Cut it out. Who does this shit and who writes this shit? This shit is terrible. Next match. Blackpool Combat Club versus the Jericho Appreciate Society. Claudio and Willie Uta versus Darren Garcia and Jake Hager. Darren Garcia is a champion heading into this match. Darren Garcia lost. Jake Hager got the pin. Pardon me. Jake Hager got pinned. Y'all wish he got the fucking pin on this show. No, Jake Hager's not winning shit. Get out of here. Not before final battle. Get out of here. So, by the way, the only thing you really need to know about this match is... Well, well, yeah. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I already rated... Did I rate Joe and Allen already? Yeah, I did. I gave it a 7 and Logic a 4. Okay. Um, All you need to know for this match is that a We The People champ broke out. Austin, Texas. Cedar Park, Texas. Wherever the fuck this show was. We The People. Y'all were chanting We The People tonight. Cedar Park, Texas. Y'all are making me fucking nauseous. Y'all make me nauseous with that chain. Didn't Jericho mention three years ago that we the people was a part of bad creative. And um, Jake Hager and Claudio Casangoli were a part of the Real Americans and that it was a bad tag team. Didn't Chris Jericho just mention it three weeks, three years ago? Y'all wish it was three weeks ago. Three years ago. I think it was one of the first promos that Jericho cut anyway after the Inner Circle just got formed. It was one of the first promos he ever cut on AEW Dynamite. 
All you need to know, Claudio got the win on Jake Hager with a uppercut that knocked him out. And there you go. Uh, I'll give Wrestling 5 Logic 1 because I did not fucking care about this match. Plus, number one, Claudio was going to win anyway. Jake Hager was going to fucking lose. So no one fucking cared. And I don't think anyone else uh, really fucking cared. Tony Schiavone, his third appearance tonight. Tony Schiavone shows us an interview he did with William Regal weeks before Full Gear. No, after Full Gear. Yeah, he did it after Full Gear. And he thinks that will shed some light on recent events. First of all, why did it take Tony Schiavone fucking uh, two weeks to have William Regal have an interview with him? It took him two weeks? You couldn't just tell the Blackpool Combat Club in a sit-down interview? That was the, that's the dumbest fucking shit. Why, why does this shit happen? Regal says people will only see this if something bad happens to him and said he's a great exception to what MJF did to Tony Schiavone. MJF just pushed Tony Schiavone. That's all he did. He didn't punch him in the face. He didn't hit a power driver on him. He didn't fucking hit him with the dynamite diamond ring. He didn't even hit the man from behind. He didn't even hit him on commentary. What the fuck did William Regal have against MJF only for him to join MJF and helping him win? What the fuck sense does that fucking make to me? That makes no sense to any of you fucking people. None. None. MJF is world champion. Be careful what you wish for because everyone will, in this company will be chasing him. Ricky Starks is chasing him. So I don't think anyone else is going to chase him. He realized months ago that he was surplus to the requirements of the Blackpool Combat Club. But he knew they wouldn't let him go. So he wanted to show them he could go. And they could teach Wheeler Yuta to make him the best wrestler he can be. And says, this is his final lesson. Always stay one step ahead and always keep eyes in the back of your head. He's Blackpool Combat Club until the day he's dead and it's been emotional. First of all, cut the shit. Number one, William Regal, always stay one step ahead. Um, first of all, you hated MJF and then you joined the man. This was made, this was obvious, this was a last minute decision. By Tony Khan before Full Gear. This was a last minute decision. So it, it just it just doesn't add up. What do you mean one step ahead? You know what he really should have done? William Regal at Full Gear? He should have helped John Moxley retain the belt. And have him use the brass knives. And we can finally get a heel fucking John Moxley again. I like heel John Moxley. I don't I'm not fucking with this. Good guy John Moxley bullshit. John Moxley needs to beat every everyone's fucking ass. That's it. We don't need a baby. He don't need to be cheered. But then he'll have his uh, wild song thing. His wild thing song fucking. Uh, what, whatever. What fucking ever. I don't give a flying motherfuck. Final battle. This feud with the Jericho Appreciate Society is over. I mentioned it earlier on. House of Black vignette. House of Black was the fucking best thing on this entire show. House of Black vignettes. They will declare war on anyone who has an issue for them. And they issue a challenge for next week. So House of Black is going to be in action. Probably against some fucking jobbers. I don't know. And I'll be honest with you. Right now about the House of Black. They should be fighting the best friends. At Winter is Coming. Okay. That's what they should be doing. Other than that, I don't care. It should be Trent, Chuck, and Rocky Romero versus the House of Black for Winter is Coming. That is what I would have liked. Because we can finally build up the House of, Bra the House of Black as a dominant fucking faction. And they need to go after the trio's titles by revolution. And if they're not doing that, somebody is not doing their fucking job in all elite wrestling. Somebody is not doing their fucking job. Tony Schiavone sit down interview with Jamie Hayter. Tony Schiavone had five segments. This is his fourth fucking appearance tonight. Oh my God. Tony fucking Schiavone, get off my fucking television. Tony Schiavone with Jamie Hayter. She says the division is getting interesting and she's on top of the totem pole. Great. She's going to do her job and defend the title. 
By the way, she says, whoever wins out of Hikaru Shido and the Bunny, for by the way, for the Regatta de Wave, which is a women's championship in Japan, if I understand, a women's Japan, a women's championship in Japan, um, I think it's in DDT, the pro wrestling company in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's in that company. Or something uh, something entirely different. It's not all Japan. I know that. So, anyway, Hikaru Shida is defending her women's championship in Japan on Rampage. Hikaru Shida and Bunny, the winner of that match, they face Jamie Hayter at a later date because Jamie Hayter is a fighting champion. First of all, Hikaru Shida and the Bunny should be nowhere fucking near a women's championship match. And I don't hate neither women. The booking for some of this shit has been fucking atrocious. I've been pointing this out for weeks on it, and I will continue to do that because it's my job. Hikaru Shida and the Bunny should be nowhere near a fucking women's title show. That's fucking ridiculous. Who writes this shit? Jay Cargo and the Baddies. Get off my fucking TV. I've said this eight times tonight. Jay Cargo and the Baddies versus Kiara Hogan, who got kicked out of the Baddies for no reason at all. Madison Rain and Sky Blue. By the way, Sky Blue. I, I gotta say something. Sky Blue looked very impressive in this match. Very impressive in this match. I can appreciate Sky Blue's wrestling ability. The one thing I did not like was the finish of this match. I actually did see this match in its entirety. The match went six minutes. Six, seven minutes. Um, Sky Blue clocked Red Velvet with a super kick. And she went for a tope suicida, but she got tripped up in the ring skirt. And Red Velvet hammers her with forearms. Commercial break. Red Velvet and Sky Blue going at it. Uh, final slice countered. Both women are down. Tags made. Hogan and Jay Cargo legal. Kiara lighting up Jay Cargo with elbows and a drop kick. She passes Lil Gray to the floor. She beats the hell out of Lil Gray. Sliding drop kick in the corner to Jay Cargo. She kicks Red Velvet to the floor. Holding, holding, uh, Kiara Hogan lighting Jade up with a boot. But she ate a thrust spine buster. Madison reigned and tags in after the spine buster. And Jay Cargo hit her with Jade at one, two, three. Waste of everybody's motherfucking time. No rating whatsoever. And I actually, look, Sky Blue and Red Velvet, I would like to see a match between these two women on Rampage. I would love to see that. Unfortunately, I have a problem with this entire match because this was the semi-main event of this show. Number one. Number two, no one cared about this match. Number three, Jay Cargo was on TV and she is being protected now. Why is she being protected? What the fuck does Jay Cargo bring to the table that is anything but presentable. Maybe her looks, but her wrestling ability is fucking dog water. Jesus Christ, she's terrible. Unfucking believable. Waste of everybody's time. No rating at all. It sucked. Tony Giovanni making his final appearance on AEW Dynamite. OMG, Tony Giovanni had five segments tonight. He's he may be worse than Renee Paquette. Tony Giovanni interviews Soraya. Before Soraya says anything, Dr. Britt Baker shows up. Dr. Britt Baker, G O M T V. She congratulates Soraya on the biggest win of her career and promises her it won't happen again. She says Soraya came to AEW and her first match was a pay per view match against the biggest star on the show. She has plane for tickets for uh, January 11th, 2023. Where Soraya can sit in the front row or she can have a match. Soraya versus Britt Baker at the Kia Forum in Los Angeles on January the 11th. Who the fuck wants to see that shit again? I don't. But it set, But Britt Baker says, not against Britt in a singles match, but in a tag team match against her, Jamie Hayter, against Soraya and a partner of her choosing. That is January 11th, 2023. Will we review that show? Probably not. Maybe, maybe not. Main event, FTR versus the acclaimed best match on this entire show. This match was great. There was a lot. There was a lot of, um, oh man. Don't get me started on this other fucking shit. FTR came out with all their belts. The acclaimed came out. They rapped. FTR stands for find the remote according to Max Caster. First of all, FTR 
They're not get off my TV. The acclaimed is get off my fucking television. Ten times I've said this. All within the matter of fucking 40, 40 minutes. Max Caster says that they're going to lose like Herschel Walker. Yes, a Herschel Walker reference made in 2022. Max Caster, I don't want to hear anything from you about Herschel Walker ever again. Herschel Walker is fucking associated with Donald Trump. That fucking douchebag. Don't get me started on that motherfucker. For the AEW World Tag Team titles, FTR versus The Acclaimed. I apologize for all the F-bombs. But still, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not liking The Acclaimed right now. The Acclaimed right now, they are cringe like fucking TV. They're cringe on TV. Seriously. So they begin with wrestling. Great. Uh, tag the bone, shoulder arm breaker, but hardwood clocks it with a right hook. Chops in the corner. They are fighting over hip tosses. They end up in the ropes, and referee Paul Turner tries and fails to separate them. Oh, by the way. Hold on. <clears throat> Paul Turner. Goon. There you go. Bowen's off the top with the... Uh, oh, fuck. I can't say this. I cannot say this. I can't say this move. It, it was a, it was a, it was a uh, clothesline. It was a, a flying clothesline. Working Dax over. He slides under. Double leg into the sharpshooter, but Caster blocks with palm strikes. So they get double sharpshooters on FTR. Fight into the floor, they catapult Max Caster into the frame of the ring and pause. I, I can't say it. They do the whole um Oh God, there was a lot of this shit on this fucking main event. Oh fuck. And by the way, to begin the match for this match. Um fuck. They had a chant. I, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. It's, it's, it's sus. I can't say it. Anyway, we're back from a picture in picture. Uh, Cash gets knocked down. Max Castle goes off to the top for cross body for a two count. Dax Harwick checks in. Back body drop. Tagged Anthony Bowens. Big right hands to both men. Punches in overhand elbows. Take Dax Harwick down. Running knee gets Bowens to two count. Harwood then fires up. German suplexes. O'Connor roll for a two count. Harwood stops to stop short at a malfunction. Fireman's carry. Neckbreaker from Anthony Bowens. Kick out. FTR with spike. Power driver. Kick out. Looking for a double brain buster. Bowens reverses. Small package and a rolling elbow. But neither do the job. La Casadora. Ace crusher. Dax wants it too much. They looked for a big rig. Did FTR. But Caster blocked it. He gets Dax Harwood up. Harwood reverses and passes him into the turnbuckles. They get Caster up. They hit the big rig. But Bowens breaks it up. Anthony Bowens hits the arrival. Mike drop misses by Max Caster. Barnes with a diving lariat for Dax Harwood on the floor. Cash Wheeler clocks him with the gory face buster, which was a very nice move. Max rolls him up for a two count. Trading stripes and a big lariat wipes Max Caster out. A second one, Wheeler, Cash Wheeler draws him up and hits a third lariat. They hit a... Um, Cash Wheeler hit a 10 power powerbomb, which was a sitting sit-out powerbomb, but countered by... Max Caster, one, two, three. They he rolled up Cash Wheeler and the Acclaim win in a great match on AEW Dynamite between the Acclaimed and FTR. I'll give this match eight. Logic seven. Good match. Did this this despite all the other stuff, the Acclaimed are actually being built up despite their gimmick. I can appreciate that. But FTR, they may need to turn heels. Yeah, I don't know about that. Anyway, to end the show, the Gun Club. The Gun Club was on the big screen. They got FTR some Christmas presents. I'm sure they did. Probably it was ass cream that Goldust gave back in the day. Why is Goldust being mentioned on this show? I don't know. They have a card from them boys, the Briscoe Brothers, challenging them to a match at Final Battle. A double dog collar match for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Titles. Holy shit. Briscoe's FTR 3. And the Briscoe's 
must win the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles this time around, right? Because they got beat twice already in match of the year candidates. So, yeah, that's it. So that was last week's AEW Dynamite and this week's AEW Dynamite for December 7th, 2022. And last week was November 30th, 2022. All right, that's enough AEW talk. Now it's time for uh, last week's SmackDown, which happened on December the 2nd, 2022. Let me uh, find this really fast. We're going to review SmackDown very briefly for last week. As I said earlier on, I'm not reviewing uh, SmackDown this week at all. Because, simply put, nothing really is happening on SmackDown except the Bloodline and Kevin Owens and Ricochet facing Gunther for the Intercontinental title. So I will review December 2nd, 2022. This was, we were in Buffalo, New York at the Key Bank Center. By the way, Buffalo, Buffalo New York was actually a, great, a better crowd. Um, it was a better crowd than Albany. I, I don't get me started on fucking Albany, New York. Albany, New York can kiss my fucking black ass. That shit, that fucking crowd was fucking miserable. That was number one. And now I'm going to leave it at that. All right, we're on last week's SmackDown, December 2nd, 2022 in Buffalo, New York. Sami Zayn versus Sheamus. This was a great match. Second best match on this entire show. Um, all you need to know, really, is that Sami and Sheamus had a very physical match, very good match, and... Pretty much, Sami Zayn is super over as fuck right now. Fans were rallying for Sami Zayn. They both get up. Zayn avoids a bro kick. Jay Uso hits the apron to distract him. Sheamus grabs Sami Zayn and delivers the 10 beats of the Bowser again, but goes to 20. Sheamus goes for the bro kick, but Jimmy Uso distracts, allowing Sami to avoid the bro kick. Sami distracts the referee, allowing Jimmy to hit Sheamus with a kick. Sami with the blue thunder bomb for its close two count. That was a fucking awesome near fall. Butch and Rich Holland brawl with the Usos. So Sokoa attacks and levels Rich Holland. Slams, she slams Butch into the top of the barricade with a spinning solo on the barricade, which was brutal, by the way. Awesome move. So Sokoa goes back to brawling with Rich now. Sheamus blocks the Haluba kick with a big knee strike. Sheamus scoops Sammy up for white noise, but Jimmy Uso again distracts the fucking referee. Jay Uso to rush in and save Sammy with a super kick. Sammy goes right into a roll-up. Sammy Zayn won because of Jay Uso. So... Sami Zayn beats Sheamus. Clean. Great. Um, I gave wrestling I gave wrestling a 7. And Logic, I gave it a... I'll give this a 3. Because the Us, the bloodline, the Usos, they got involved, as always. It was traditional, uh, as we say here. Bloodline bullshit. There you go. BLBS. There you go. We go to replays. The bloodline celebrate. All right. Next, Cole confirms the World Cup's finals. Ricochet versus Santos Escobar, which we will get to in just a second. We get a backstage segment. Look out of Fantasma. Santos says they have only flourished since arriving on SmackDown, and now he will make sure the World Cup is in the rightful hands of their perfect empire. By the way, Santos Escobar has not been defeated on SmackDown since coming on SmackDown. Keep this in mind. Santos is the very best his industry has to offer, and the results speak for itself. Selena Vega says soon that we will all see the Emperor Santos. Pardon me. When the fuck did Santos Escobar become the Emperor? The Emperor of what? About to get about to fucking lose every about the, it, what the fuck is Santos Escobar the S the Emperor of? Is he about to lose his next two or three matches? Because he can't lose tonight. He's undefeated, right? <sighs> I know. He says Ricochet made it this far, but it's about time his fairy tale comes down to the final chapter. Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wallace say Legato Reign Supreme, and they all laugh, and we go to commercial. We get a Royal Rumble promo. Megan Moran backstage with Kofi Kingston, still employed. Kofi Kingston declares himself for the men's Royal Rumble match. Kofi Kingston became the first man to declare himself. In the men's Royal Rumble match. And I immediately got a problem with that. Because first of all. There was no Royal Rumble qualifying match. There was no match for Kofi Kingston. And Kofi Kingston. Can I tell you something bro. Just because you beat Impedium. 
does not warrant a Royal Rumble spot. Which means literally you just declared yourself as number one in the Royal Rumble match. Who the fuck wants to see Kofi Kingston at number one? Not me. You? I doubt it. Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci interrupt. They have words with Kingston. Kofi knows they want a match, but unfortunately, Xavier Woods is not here. But he will wrestle either one of them, Gunther versus Kofi Kingston, later on tonight. Are you fucking kidding me? Jesus Christ. Bray Wyatt backstage. Do you know what he thinks is wild? He thinks we're all spoiled these days. Society has given us this lavish lifestyle. We're all shrouded in technology. Everyone has manners. He thinks that we typically forget how once upon a time we were all just animals. Yes, Bray Wyatt talking about evolution. As if that was not talked about in the movie Inherit the Fucking Wind. Please watch that movie, by the way. Spiders eat flies even to this day. Snakes eat grass, but nobody looks at this like an act of violence. It's simply animals trying to survive. He says some must die so others can live, and you don't want to be the one that dates. We don't dare talk about those things. Primal instincts ingrained, but we don't talk about them because we don't want to be a freak. We want to fit in our own piece of society, but they're still there. Wyatt says he's not the one who hurt L.A. Knight. We see how Knight slapped Bray Wyatt, and uh, L.A. Knight was laid up backstage. Bray Wyatt says he didn't do it, but he heard Uncle Howdy, who laughs, and he says, Oh, how you rejoice. How primal of you. However, if Bray Wyatt did attack L.A. Knight, we would all know because there would be nothing left of him. And that was the end of the segment. Great segment. Uh, we got a recent happening of Shotzi Blackheart, Raquel Rodriguez, Shayna Baszler, and Ronda Rousey. Shayna Baszler versus Emma. This match went four minutes. No rating at all. Terrible match. Emma and Madcap Moss was literally, you know. Emma and Madcap Moss are a thing now. Emma kisses him on the cheek and the fans in the arena. They popped big time for this. First of all, I do not want to see Emma and Matt Cat Moss as an on-screen romance. And here's another thing. Emma lost in four minutes to Shayna Baszler. No ready. After the belt, Baszler takes her time to let it go into the hole. She stands tall. Uh, Baszler poses over Emma and then kicks the hurt arm. And Emma's trying to crawl away. Shotzi Blackheart comes out. She rushes the ring, ducks as a clothesline, and then unloads on Baszler. Baszler with a knee strike that shot to drop Shotzi Blackheart. Basil goes to Sama Shotzi arm now. The music interrupts. Raquel Rodriguez still wearing her arm brace. And Raquel Rodriguez holds off Shayna Baszler with one arm. Emma Rodriguez points Baszler, but Baszler gets the hell out of there. So Shotzi, Ricard, Ricard Rodriguez, and Emma are a uh, trio now. And they're going to go after Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey. Okay. All right. This vignette. Oh, fuck. A new back to basics vignette for Lacey fucking Evans. My silence is better than Lacey Evans being back on my fucking TV. Next! Gunther versus Kofi Kingston. This match went nine minutes. Uh... Gunther drop kicked Kofi into the turnbuckle. Gunther with a power bomb, but Kofi Kingston kicked out. And no, this was not. I'm talking about the finish of the match, by the way. Braun Strowman came out and he beat the shit out of Imperium. And uh, yeah, that was that. Uh, Gunther won, obviously, with the new Last Symphony finisher, which I believe was a. What was it? Was it a power slam? Of some kind, I'm not too sure, but I will uh, try to figure this out. Anyway, Gunther won. The match went nine minutes. I gave wrestling, uh, I gave it a six. Logic a one because Gunther was gonna win anyway. Bloodline segment backstage. Jimmy Uso tells Sami Zayn to take Solo to call with him because Sami has made a lot of enemies. Sami and Solo leave. Jimmy can't believe Jay Uso is trusting Sami and he's in the bloodline. Jay say he never thought he'd see the day. Jimmy asks if Jay ever talked to Sammy about lying to him. Jay says no because Roman Reigns said he saw what he needed to see what he looked in Sammy's eyes. Jay says they also saw how war games went. Sheamus then beats the shit out of the Usos with a sh fucking shillelagh. Yes, Sheamus becoming the new Finley with fucking shillelaghs everywhere. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. 
Is Fit Finley writing this show? I hope not. He says he and Drew McIntyre will be waiting for the Usos. We have a match made for next week between those two men. Uh, pardon me, two teams. Damage Control. Oh, God. Damage Control, get off my TV. Next, Bailey takes the mic and starts insulting the fans as they boo. Michael Cole must have missed her. No, Bailey, I did not miss you. Neither of these fucking people who listen to this res wrestling roundup did not miss you. I miss the old Bailey where you didn't have this fucking, you know, you didn't care about what everyone else think. And now you have Dakota Sky and Io Sky as your fucking goons just backing you up. You know damn well you can win a match, right? On your own, right? All right. Becky brings up Bailey Lynch. The crowd is happy. Becky Lynch is not here tonight because she's on Raw. She sends Sky and Kai to the into the barricade. Liv Morgan comes out. Why is Liv Morgan fucking with damage control? It's fucking stupid. So Liv Morgan attacks them, but then the numbers game come into play. Tegan Knox makes her WWE return. Tegan Knox is back, everybody. Awesome. Knox is triple team. Fans boo. Liv Morgan brings a Kendall stick in and saves Tegan Knox. Tegan Knox with the Chinese wizard to Bailey, which was awesome. And Tegan Knox music backs up and damage control retreats on the outside. Now, time for the best match on this entire, in this entire weekly wrestling roundup. The best match ever, pretty much on SmackDown. This was fucking fantastic. Santos Escobar versus Ricochet, the World Cup Finals match of the fucking review right here. This match was fantastic. But before we go to that, Caddy and Cross. And Scarlet. Scarlet's flipping through her tarot cards. Karrion Cross says this uni universe is one giant storm, chaos, and randomness, which he embraced a long time ago. While others struggle with this reality, finding themselves in places they don't want to be. Cross said he showed this to Drew McIntyre and had to teach this to Matt Moss. Now, it's time to take someone else into the eye of the storm. He asked Scarlet to show the card, and it's Rey Mysterio. Cross laughs as the clock ticks down. On Rey Mysterio. Okay. We go back into the ring, but graphics flash, Uncle Howdy shows up. He asks if you know the man who lives next door. Uh, no, I don't. I know who uh, lives next door to me. A man who's about to get off my fucking TV. Fucking Bray Wyatt right now. Bray Wyatt needs to wrestle a match. Please, I'm sick of these fucking promos. Why can't you all see? Uncle Howdy knows how Bray Wyatt thinks, how he feels. Are you his brother? Oh, that's right. You're his uncle. Who is Uncle Howdy? We don't know. It's all fiction. Trust us. Trust me. So, Uncle Howdy just told all of you, each and every last one of you, that this shit is all fiction. Uncle Howdy just exposed Bray Wyatt's character like that. Fake. Who writes this shit? Who writes this shit? Whoever does this, this shit is terrible. This is fucking god awful. Ricochet versus Santos Escobar. Match of the entire review. This was great. Uh, I'm not really finna go to the rest of this match. This was a fucking great match. If none of you have seen this match, uh, try to find it on, um, the Fox app or whatever the case may be. If anyone finds this match between Santos and Ricochet, please go watch this match. This was the best match of this entire show. Pretty much, this may be, honestly, I'll be honest with y'all. Ricochet and Santos Escobar had a top five match of the year candidate. Right here in this match. I'm going to go out on a limb. They had a top five match. This match was fucking great. So all you need to know is that I'm going to give cliff notes for this uh, match here. So they trade strikes in the middle of the ring. They both collide head to head and go down. Referee checks on both competitors. He do yeah, he does his usual count. Escobar rolls to the floor. Ricochet follows him. Cole confirms the winner faces Gunther in two weeks. And I will probably not review that match because... 
first of all, uh, Gunther is going to win anyway, so I don't really see the point in that. But anyway, yes, Gunther versus the winner of this match. Escobar and Ricochet meet on top of the barricade and they fight it. Escobar with a big Hurricanrana, which sent Ricochet on the outside, which was fucking awesome, by the way. Escobar brings it back in for a two count. Escobar with more offense. Escobar stomps away to keep Ricochet down. Escobar runs the ring and drops an elbow to the back and then applies a chin lock. Jesus Christ. Why? I don't know. Chanto with a big chop in the corner. He takes him to the top and Ricochet sends him down. Ricochet looks to fly, but Escobar rolls to the apron. Escobar climbs up and chops Ricochet. Escobar with another hurricane round, but Ricochet lands on his feet, which was fucking great. He turns around and stares Escobar down. Ricochet with a jumping knee strike, then a suplex. Ricochet rolls through for the vertical suplex, and then a moonsault, which was great. Two count. Ricochet sends Escobar into the turnbuckles. Ricochet goes to the top for a shooting star press, but Escobar suckers him in, gets his knees up, and Ricochet kicks out of two off the knees by Santos Escobar. Escobar scoops up Ricochet, but Ricochet fights out to avoid the Phantom Driver. Escobar kicks out of two. Escobar spikes Ricochet on his head with a poison runner for a two count, which was for fucking close near fall. That was great. Escobar mounts Ricochet with strikes. Escobar scoops Ricochet to his shoulder, climbs for a middle rope. He went for a avalanche phantom driver, but Ricochet with forearms. Ricochet launches Escobar with a top rope hurricane runner, a springboard hurricane runner, I might add, which was fucking great. Ricochet hit big kicks on him. Ricochet hits the 630 splash. Ricochet crawls over. One, two, three. Santos Escobar is no longer undefeated, and Ricochet wins the SmackDown World Cup. Thank God Triple H is booking, be booking Ricochet better than he already is. Thank you. And after the match, Gunther stares down Ricochet, and that was the end of SmackDown. So that was pretty much the end of SmackDown. I gave this match 9, Logic a 7, because this match was fucking fantastic. That was the main event of the show, by the way. Uh, Ricochet and Santos Escobar. There you go. Uh, I'm not really going to re recap all the, uh, the, you know, all the ratings and stuff like that, because pretty much it's not important. And now, fuck. Unfortunately, I got to review this fucking miserable Monday Night Raw. Monday Night Raw, December 5th, 2022, from the, it's a cap, it's a state, no, it's not State Farm. It's not the State Farm Center. Because State Farm Arena is Atlanta, right? Yeah. I don't even think it's even Capital One Arena anymore. It used to be called the Capital One Arena. Anyway, that's where they were, the home of the Wizards for Monday Night Raw in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. Boy, do I got something to say to y'all. Washington, D.C. crowd for Monday Night Raw. <clears throat> you guys were fucking terrible. That's all. Terrible crowd. All right, I got a review roll. Anyway, first first uh, segment was Beck was Bailey in the ring. Bailey talked to uh, everyone, and Bailey was uh, letting fans talk, which was fucking no. I'm, I apologize. Sorry, that was last week. That was fucking awful last week. Anyway, let me uh, let me find Monday Night Raw really fast, guys, because obviously. Shit happens every now and then. All right, so let me find Monday Night Raw really fast. Because Monday Night Raw is fucking miserable. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Never mind, I got it. All right, Monday Night Raw had a lot of shit. First of all, there was supposed to be a tag team match. Between Elias and Matt Riddle versus the Usos for the tag team titles. First of all, what the fuck did Matt Riddle and Elias do to get a tag team title shot? They've been a tag team for two weeks. Two whole weeks and they were getting a tag team title shot. Which was fucking stupid. But anyway, 
I believe, pardon me, the opening segment for Monday Night Raw. Let me, let me get it loading here. Because Washington, Washington D.C. was so terrible. Except the opening match, which was the tag team, the tag team uh, match between the Usos and Kevin Owens and Matt Riddle. What, and, it was, and it was for the tag team titles. There you go. Yes, we were in the Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. Terrible. Terrible crowd. Um, the Bloodline say that um, they are the ones that they will remain on top because everyone else's are the twos. The shits. Uh, Riddle says, Riddle then comes out, Riddle says, it's not like the, it's not like the bloodline to run from a fight, not very oozy, yes, Matt Riddle stealing lines all of a sudden, Matt Riddle needs to fight for the U.S. title before the end of the new year, and if this man is not, something is terribly wrong, but then I realize he gets fucking hit in the throat with the Samoan spike by Samo by Solo Sokoa, the, uh, Samoan, big Samoan, Man, Solo Sokoa, I am really liking Solo Sokoa. I'm going to tell you all right now, if Solo Sokoa is not United States champion by SummerSlam, I will be shocked. I will be shocked if this man is not champion. Bro, this man can easily, easily be U.S. champion right now. Because Austin Theory ain't doing a motherfucking thing. He's fucking fucking around with Dolph Ziggler, Mustafa Ali, Seth Rollins, and Bobby Lashley, all within literally a two-week time span. Time span, pardon me. Anyway, Kevin Owens and Matt Riddle versus The Usos. This was a good match. The crowd was actually into this match. Unfortunately, this show went downhill from here. Uh, the Usos hit the 1D on Matt Riddle for the win. And then, as I said earlier on, Solo Sokoa hit the Samoan Spike on Matt Riddle. And Matt Riddle is out of action, which means now Matt Riddle is gone from TV. Hooray! Unfortunately, he will not get a push when he comes back. Anyway, next segment. Oh, by the way, uh, rating. Bloodline versus Matt Riddle and Kevin Owens. Wrestling, 7. Logic, 5. Good match. Oh, boy. JBL. By the way, for Monday Night Raw, there will be a lot of get the fuck off my TV. I have said this approximately 14 times today. And now make it 15. JBL, get off my fucking TV. You motherfuckers had an invitational poker tournament on live national television. You motherfuckers wasted three hours of everybody's motherfucking time. Here are all the people that were in this uh, segment. Tamina Snooker, still employed. Get off my TV. Dana Brooks, still employed. Get off my TV. Akira Tozawa, get off my fucking television. Dominic Mysterio. Sean Benjamin, still employed. OC, Alpha Academy, still employed. Baron Corbin, still employed. JBL, still employed. Dexter Loomis approached everyone. Dexter Loomis has a good poker face, apparently. Great. And no one, and JBL says that no one likes Akira Tozawa. Good. I'm glad he said that. No, unfortunately, JBL, no one likes your bitch ass on my fucking television. JBL says the rules are simple, but he begins, and Johnny Gargano and Dexter Loomis enter. JBL says this is invitational, and he guarantees these two or these one and a half were not invited. Loomis just signed his contract and probably doesn't have the 50 dime buy in. Loomis dumps the bag of money out, and everyone is impressed. JBL welcomes Dexter Loomis to the game, and he says, let's start the tournament. Number one contenders, qualifier, triple threat match, Bailey, Asuka, and Rhea Ripley. Uh, I didn't really necessarily care about this match because all you need to know really is that, uh, you know, Asuka, Bailey, and Rhea Ripley actually had a decent match on this show. Unfortunately, the crowd just died a thousand deaths. It was terrible. And it's a shame because, you know, this could have been a great match on a pay per view. Instead, this was given to us on free TV. So, all you need to know, this is the Cliff Note version. Bailey goes to attack uh, Asuka, but Rhea Ripley catches her. He tries strikes in the ring. Asuka rushes him in with a double code breaker, which was awesome, by the way. Two count. Uh, Ripley comes in, breaks the hold from an Asuka lock into a basement dropkick for a two count. Rhea Ripley with a big clothesline to Asuka, then a chop. Asuka blocks the clothesline and takes Ripley down. Bailey flies off the second rope with an elbow to break it up, but Asuka kicks out of two. 
Bailey pounds on Oscar to keep her down. Bailey with the Bailey to belly, but Rhea Ripley breaks it up. Ripley with three big head butts on Bailey, then a northern light suplex. Bailey kicks out. Ripley dunks a kick by Oscar and then drives it into Matt from up on his shoulders, which was a fireman's carry slam of some kind. I don't know. Anyway, Oscar kicks out, and Rhea Ripley can't believe it. And Rhea Ripley runs and drop kicks Bailey off the apron. Ripley goes to the floor and runs and leaps off the steel ring steps, but she misses Bailey, and Bailey comes in. It's the Rose Plant. One, two, three. I gave wrestling five. Logic. I'll give it a. F I'll give it a five. I, I thought this was decent. Uh, this was okay in my honest opinion, but I necessarily did not really give a flying fuck about this because this was all to set up a match between Bailey and the winner of the main event for next week, and the winner of that match next week will face Bianca Belair for the Raw Women's Championship. I am. I've been, speak, I've been speaking for literally nearly an hour and a half. And I think this is actually one of my better ones so far. Seth Rollins laughing backstage. Kevin Patrick announced a number one contenders match between Rollins and Bobby Lashley. They will face Austin Theory at a later date. Seth Rollins comes to the ring. Rollins takes the mic and introduces himself. He's fired up about his match with Lashley. Uh, Rollins says... It sounded like they had fun singing a song, so they sing again. Lashley comes out to a big pop. The crowd actually woke up because Bobby Lashley was employed. Fans chant for Lashley, and she faces off with Rollins. Lashley says he's here, so what does Rollins want to tell him? Lashley wants Rollins to be careful what he says. Rollins says Lashley isn't the same since losing to Brock at Crown Jewel, which we, we, we did review. Rollins says we've all been there, but what is your obsession with Lesnar? He asked, scarily, he asked Lashley if he's scared of Brock Lesnar. No, he was not, because he faced the man fucking twice, and Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar split at a match piece. Their first match at the Rumble, eh, Crown Jewel, much better, but Brock Lesnar won. There you go. Lashley grabs Rollins' collar and says this isn't about Lesnar, this is about Rollins and him and the U.S. title that should be around his waist. Rollins says the title won't fill the void left by Lashley, knowing he's not Brock Lesnar. Okay, stop right there. Seth Rollins. Stop. Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar are two different men. Both men were in MMA. Both men had great careers. Both men are Hall of Famers. But why are we comparing Brock Lesnar to Bobby Lashley? Who writes this shit? Bobby Lashley and Brock Lesnar are nowhere on the same stratosphere at, on each other. And, and that's nothing... And I'm not saying... Bobby Lashley cannot fucking wrestle. I'm not saying he can't work. I'm saying they went entirely separate paths in that Bobby Lashley was a an army guy. He's a military guy. No nonsense, right? Brock Lesnar was from the farms in Minnesota. He had to wrestle in the NCAA. And, you know, he was in WWE. And he got over and pushed big time to the fucking moon. And then he left again, and then he got pushed back to the moon again. It, th these are all entirely two different men. So why are we comparing the both of these two? It's my fucking question. I don't understand this fucking logic. But then again, this is Monday Night Raw. There's no fucking logic for this fucking show. Rollins and Lashley brawl. Uh, security break them up. Official break them up. Rollins breaks free from them and leaps on the Lashley. The brawl continues. It continues in the ring. Lashley charged it with a spear, but he accidentally hits... P P D Williams, and P D Williams died within a matter of fucking ten seconds on that spear. Jesus Christ, he got split in half like a log. Holy fuck! Hopefully, Peter P D Williams is okay. I almost said Peter, but it's P D. Okay, there you go. Adam Pierce is furious now, yelling at Lashley. Byron Saxton, who was still employed, catches up with Austin Theory backstage. Asking him what he just saw. Theory says we just saw two former champions fighting over scraps. Oblivious to the fact that the business has evolved and forgotten about them. No, we have not forgotten about those two. Because they just fought literally on this fucking three hour piece of shit Monday Night Raw. With a fucking poker tournament. And matches made because of a fucking poker tournament. Theory says fine. Oh, by the way. Mustafa Ali has the long hair back. Thank you. Mustafa Ali comes up to Austin Theory. Why are we getting another Mustafa Ali versus Austin Theory match? So, Austin Theory versus Mustafa Ali uh, down the line. 
I don't know if it's uh, literally next week. I hope not. There you go. Okay, another JBL poker segment. Chad Gable folds his hand and talks about knowing when to walk away, but Luke Gallows calls him a nerd. They have a shoosh and nerd. Yeah, <laughs> I sounded like Grandpa Simpson on that. Baron Corbin tells him to relax because he's trying to get a read on Dexter Loomis. Corbin lays his card down and tells Loomis to show. Loomis had a full house. Corbin calls him a cheater. There's no way Loomis can beat him. Corbin accuses Loomis of having cards in his sleeve. Corbin goes to physically threaten Loomis, but Loomis pulls out an axe and places it in the middle of the table. What the fuck? Why did Dexter Loomis pull out an axe? What the fuck? <laughs> Akira Tozawa about to take all the chips, but Domino still talks some trash, threatening him with a judgment day. Tozawa laughs and says, he doesn't care. You are the problem. Akira Tozawa, you are the problem of you being on my fucking television. I've said this for approximately the 17th time tonight. Get off my TV. 18. Oh, never mind about the Austin Theory Mustafa Ali thing. It happened tonight. Mustafa Ali versus Austin Theory. Match went the match went four minutes. It was a DQ because Dolph Ziggler came out and super kicked Austin Theory. No rating. Another JBL poker segment. Chad Gable has folded again. The Miz walk up and they shake hand. By the way, this was actually one of the better things on this entire show. This segment was, not everything else. Because this segment was, because everything else was fucking miserable. Miz walks up and they shake hands. Miz said there was a slight oversight on JPL's part because Miz wasn't invited to the tournament. Why would the Miz be in a poker tournament? I don't fucking know. I don't fucking care. I thought he was hurt. Remember, guys, he was hurt because of a fucking TikTok. And that was last week. So um, how is he still standing? It's my question. Miz says due to his recent financial impro improprieties, he doesn't have liquid cash, but he says JBL knows he's good for it. JBL says Miz hasn't been really good in paying off his debts and everyone else paid cash. Miz offers his Rolex watch. JBL looks at it and asks Miz if he knows it's not real. JBL says the Rolex watch is fake. Miz is shocked. He hurries away. JBL goes back to his phone call and says, looks like Miz will not be joining us. No one cares about this entire segment. By the way, the OC versus Baron Corbin and Alpha Academy was made literally about uh, two seconds after that. And we go to it right now. I don't care about Kathy Kelly talking to Bianca Belair right now because Bianca Belair just cut a decent promo talking about and what Bailey did was impressive, but she'll be glad to face anybody. The typical babyface stuff. JBL joins Dre. Oh, no. Oh, my God. OC versus Ben Corbin at Alpha Academy. Oh my fucking god. The Usos retained over Matt Riddle and Kevin Owens, and then Solo Sokoa destroyed Riddle at well they we saw they recapped what happened earlier tonight. Alright. JBL was on commentary with Corey Graves and Kevin Patrick. Why the fuck was JBL on commentary for this fucking match? Why? Fucking, fucking, why? JBL has never, ever been a good commentator. Why was he on commentary for this match? And Chad Gable lost again for the 2,949th time. Chad Gable got pinned clean. What a magic killer. This match is getting another no rating. Next! Akira Tozawa versus Dominic Mysterio. No rating. This match went three minutes. Akira Tozawa lost because of Judgment Day. Actually, not really. But Dominic Mysterio hit the frog splash on Akira Tozawa. Akira Tozawa lost in three minutes. Akira Tozawa, I've said this for literally the fucking sixth fucking time. I cannot stand you right now. I hate Akira Tozawa the way he's being booked right now. Akira Tozawa looks like a fucking goon every time he comes to the ring. Get this man out of my fucking screen, get him off my fucking television, and get him away from fucking WWE. I'm surprised, if this man is not released within a matter of fucking two months, I will be shocked. This man needs to be released expeditiously on the spot. Get this man out of here. 
I'm getting sick of Akira Tozawa and Dominic fucking Mysterio. I'm getting sick of them right now. Get this shit out of here. Main event, Alexa Bliss, Nikki Cross, and Becky Lynch. Best match on this entire show. Unfortunately, no one fucking cared because the crowd died a thousand deaths. All you need to know is that Nikki, uh, Alexa Bliss hit Twisted Blicks on Nikki Cross for the win. So Nikki Cross in her, uh, what, second match on Monday Night Raw, she lost and got pinned by Alexa Bliss. Yeah, great, yeah, great logic, Triple H. Great fucking idea. Nikki Cross just came back. She loses to her former tag team partner. And Alexa Bliss versus Bailey next week on Raw. And Raw goes off the air. Washington, D.C., I hope you guys never get a motherfucking crowd ever again. You guys were fucking terrible except for the opening segments and the opening match of the show. Other than that, this show took a fucking nosedive. This match should have never fucking happened. In the main event, really, honestly, because Bailey and Alexa Bliss, I, I, I don't mind it too much. But then again, didn't we just see this three weeks ago when they were setting up for war games? Didn't we just see this match? So essentially, this is a rematch that um apparently has more importance now because Bianca Belair says that she'll face anybody, Rhea Ripley, Asuka, Alexa Bliss, Bailey. Why is Alexa Bliss getting pushed all of a sudden? Alexa Bliss, has she won a match? That I know she beat Bailey, but did she win a match on Raw that did not involve Bailey? Has she even won a match? Except this main event where she pinned Nikki Cross and Nikki Cross just came back and suffered a fucking loss for no fucking reason. And she lost the War Games too. It is the dumbest fucking shit. All right, everybody, that's 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 everything. I reviewed last week's AEW Dynamite, last week's SmackDown, Monday Night Raw uh, this week, and AEW Dynamite on the 7th of 2022 in December. So, as I said earlier on, I'm, I will mention SmackDown a little bit on the Final Battle review, and I am sick and tired of talking about Monday Night Raw. Monday Night Raw, I, I, I'm, about to, I'm, about to, I'm about to say something here. Monday Night Raw has been fucking atrocious for the past month now. Triple H, I'm getting sick and tired of you booking these fucking stupid fucking decisions. I don't know if it's you or your wife, Stephanie McMahon. I don't know who is making these fucking retarded, stupidest, fucking retardedest, dumbest fucking decisions. Who makes these decisions and who writes this shit? Because I can't stand this anymore. Washington, D.C. was fucking terrible for Monday Night Raw. Terrible crowd. It fucking killed the fucking entire vibe of the show. Which, by the way, this is literally the show right after the SmackDown World Cup. Right? This was right after Albany, New York. Where Albany, New York was fucking terrible. And now we head into D.C., with two triple threat matches that did not need to happen. We had Nikki Cross losing clean. We had the OC beating Chad Gable. Chad Gable who lost for the 2,949th time. Why is Chad Gable losing? That is my question. Why? What the fuck did Chad Gable do to anybody backstage? What did he do to Triple H that has resulted in him losing almost every single goddamn motherfucking week? What has Chad Gable and Otis done to deserve this? What have they done? That's all I'm asking. So let me answer that question, please. I, I'm, 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 get, I'm getting sick and tired of I'm reviewing Monday Night Raw. That's all I want to know. That's the end of this review. I literally ranted, literally, for about a minute, an hour and a half. Fucking awful. I, I don't get it. Anyway, see y'all for Ring of Honor Final Battle, which I will review in its entirety by myself. And I will talk about the Final Battle card before I review Final Battle. And also I will mention SmackDown 
And then, pretty much, uh, Winter is Coming is our season finale right here on Wrestling Logic Extra. Thank you all so much for listening to this. I appreciate every single last one of you, and I hope you all enjoyed this review. I'll see you all for a Ring of Honor Final Battle. And until then, I'm Ben Charles. So long, everybody.